India is in a festive mood, celebrating seven and a half decades of independence from British colonial rule. There is much to be happy about. In 1947, it was an impoverished, illiterate, and backward nation that had just shaken off 200 years of foreign occupation. I can't describe to you the poverty that I have seen. In my village, there were half a million or million villages of this kind. Today, it's the sixth largest economy in the world. Starting from where we did, literacy of 12%, we are now literacy somewhere around 70%. But even as Indians are getting richer at a faster rate than most major economies, sectarian tensions threaten to derail its progress. At 75, is India ready to fulfill its potential? Long years ago, we made a tryst with destiny. And now the time comes when we shall redeem our pledge. Not only or in full measure, but very substantially. At the stroke of the midnight hour, when the world sleeps, India will awake to life and freedom. Those were the words of Jawaharlal Nehru, delivered when India gained its independence from the British in 1947. One man who heard the speech on the radio is former Foreign Secretary Maharaja Krishna Rasgotra. Born in 1924, Rasgotra joined the Foreign Service in 1949 Throughout a career spanning almost four decades, he's served as India's envoy to the United States, the United Kingdom, France, and the Netherlands. At 98, Rasgotra still recalls the impression that Nehru's speech left when he first heard it. I heard that speech, and I felt very elated that finally my country's destiny is in the hands of a leader and his compeers who had struggled so hard for so many years to get the British out, peacefully if possible, in other ways, uh, if necessary. We adored Nehru in particular. Uh, I had ne met Nehru in Lahore as a young student in government college. So that speech was a, a, a source of great inspiration uh, for the young generation to which I belonged at that time. For those of the younger generation, they may not have heard Nehru's words live but their meaning still resonates decades after independence. As India celebrates 75 years as a nation, many recall what the rallying cry of independence meant for their country. <laughs> I think we were lucky that we had uh, enlightened, far-seeing founding fathers and mothers who had gave us a vision for the future, a vision anchored in the greatness of the past, and at the same time, a conviction that free of foreign rule, we'd be capable of reasserting ourselves and creating, once again, a great future. That was the tryst with destiny. Our destiny was not to be forever oppressed, but to be a land of greatness and promise. That very famous speech 
by first Prime Minister Nehru at independence uh, is of course an iconic speech. And there have been many twists. You know, immediately after independence, the country had to be put together. That was the first twist because the colonial rulers left us in a shambles. We have had many other twists. The maintenance of democracy itself was considered impossible for a developing country of this scale and size. And we've had our challenges uh, with uh, an interruption in the 70s. But that was the second twist. It was achieved. And India is today an icon of democracy around the world. Though India's freedom struggle against the British rulers was largely peaceful, the birth of the nation was bloody and traumatic. The British divided the subcontinent into two countries on communal and religious lines. West and East Pakistan flanked India on two sides. Even as Nehru talked of a new dawn, communal hatred had already gripped the nation. Hundreds of thousands died, and millions fled their homes. Razgotra witnessed the massacre and misery all around him, even as the country gained its freedom. Terrible, terrible, terrible uh, abundance of violence. The country was in a terrible state. Uh, which became aggravated, became worse because of the partition. Another man who watched the tragedy unfold during the nation's birth is Dr. Karan Singh. Dr. Singh, now 92, is the son of Raja Hari Singh, who was the then Maharaja of Kashmir. People talk about freedom. Uh, we got non-violently. Fair enough. Gandhiji's was a unique movement. But we were non-violent against the British. We were not non-violent against each other. Don't forget that. In the partition of Bengal and the partition of Punjab, millions of people were killed and uprooted and had to leave their homes. So it was both a triumph and a tragedy. It's something people don't realize. There was the, the savagery of partition, the uh, the, the flames of communal hatred blazing across the land, a million people uh, dis perhaps, perhaps butchered, another 13 million displaced out of the partition of India into India and Pakistan. Uh, it was an awful time. We saw poverty all around. I was brought up in a village, educated in a village school. All around, there was hunger, there was misery. Uh, there has, had been a terrible famine in Bengal, man-made famine. There was no shortage of food. But all those food that was available was collected for the British Army. Because they, they had no food there in, uh, in Britain anymore. Uh, and they just, just shut their eyes to the killing. It was not people dying, they were being killed deliberately. From those early years of deprivation, poverty and disease, the country has seen remarkable transformations. In 1947, India had a literacy rate barely in the double digits. Now, the overall literacy rate is in the mid-70%, with some states reaching 90%. 60 years ago, India struggled to feed its population of around 450 million people. Now it's self-sufficient in food grains, even as the population grew to over 1.3 billion. For Razgotra, India at 75 has come a long way from the scenes of his youth. I can't describe to you the poverty that I have seen. Hmm? In, in my village and around that village, and there were half a million or million villages of this kind, I never saw a peasant working in his fields in the winter with a shirt on his back. I never saw a juti on his feet. 
rags children wearing naked running around in the villages because the parents couldn't afford death starvation deaths children death uh, survival rate was very very little i saw all this that kind of poverty you don't see now today i mean we talk about poverty those who have seen that poverty uh, they realize what enormous progress we have made the 70 years at its moment of independence india found itself a long way off its pre-colonization peak almost till mid uh, 1800 century india and china were the biggest economies in the world so they were not only important in terms of civilization but even in terms of economy they were extremely big this is a country that was once the richest country on earth for a very long time and had been reduced by colonial exploitation to one of the poorest most diseased most illiterate most unfortunate places on the planet uh, with a life expectancy of 27 back in 1947 it was a colossally colossally disastrous situation as the nation developed over the next few decades there were signs that india could return to its past glory but it never quite reached those goals internal strife such as the suspension of civil liberties during the state of emergency in 1975 derailed its progress we've had our share of ups and downs you know uh, undoubtedly there has been a a dark patch as you would say the emergency was not a very pleasant thing but remember even that didn't last long we have all the ingre- ingredients needed to to be a powerhouse it's just that we need to now you know group ourselves together and as a nation put our best foot forward around the 1980 china and india had roughly the same size of economy per capita and then china's economy grew to becoming more than five times of indian economy because of their commitment to growth and indian leaders blew that opportunity yes we started under prime minister vajpayee finally uh, reaping the benefits of the uh, economic reforms and the particularly the shift towards infrastructure the indian economy had gone up to 8 9% growth and then it collapsed because there was no further reforms that period was called a uh, policy paralysis no important decision was taken for 10 years no major economic decision was taken for 10 years after decades of sputtering growth could india at 75 be on the cusp of fulfilling its promise driven by a young aspirational generation In 2019, India launched Chandrayaan-2 or Moon Chariot 2 in a bid to land a spacecraft on the moon. The project, costing 140 million US dollars, is a symbol of how far India has advanced in the last 7 and a half decades. It's now the world's third largest economy in purchasing power parity or PPP terms and the sixth largest in nominal GDP according to the World Bank. This year, the International Monetary Fund estimates the economy will grow at 7.4%. We are now the fastest growing large economy. This is a very significant moment. The fastest growing large economy status was held by China for many decades. Before that it was the US during the 20th century. Before that it was countries like uh, the UK or Germany or, or Japan at a certain point. In the years leading up to its 75th anniversary, one driver of India's economic growth has been the information technology sector. The country's IT services and outsourcing industry doubled in size in the last 10 years. One of those who helped drive the technology and IT revolution is 49-year-old Pankaj Agarwal in Gurgaon on the outskirts of Delhi. 
After a globe-trotting career spanning the US and Europe, Agarwal's life took a sudden turn over a decade ago. So I had a very good uh, lucrative job, as you know, you know, in the corporate sector, being a telecom engineer, and telecom was the booming field in uh, India. You know, this is what has actually made India. At some point in time in your career and in your life, you start thinking that why I am doing what I am doing. And I think that was something combined with a life uh, changing event that made me think about that why I am doing, you know, a corporate job, why I am into this job. The life-changing event happened when Agarwal was jet-setting from one capital to another. I was uh, in a flight and I passed out in that flight. And luckily there was a doctor that was traveling along with on that flight. So he said that, you know, once you come back, you meet me. I went and met him. So on his desk, he had this hourglass, okay? And he said that, you know, the sand in this hourglass is basically the life that you have. So the pace at which you are running, you need to basically, you know, step back, think about what you are doing. And then I think that was the start of my thought process that yes, you know, let me go back and see that what I'm doing, you know, why I'm doing that. After this incident, Agarwal wanted to do something more meaningful to help his own country. In 2011, he set up one of India's first digital payments software companies, serving the poor and the ordinary. Previous life, which was the telecom only life, it was more around the infrastructure, whereas this company was more around the consumers, you know, the people who were using it, the application part. The people who were, for example, a rickshaw puller, right, who is basically charging his mobile for 30 rupees, 50 rupees, so touching them, making sure that yes, they have something to achieve with this, uh, with this mobile, the handheld that they have. So that was the start of my journey. The thought in the back of my mind was that, you know, ultimately what we are doing should be able to uplift everyone and it should not be only about us, about me, it should be about us. Agarwal's company gave the poor access to mobile banking and payment allowing them to be part of the digital economy. Next, using his software and IT expertise, Agarwal has set up an organic food company and portal, sourcing produce from farmers in remote Himalayan villages and selling to customers as far away as the United States and Denmark. Agarwal's efforts caught the attention of Prime Minister Narendra Modi, who mentioned his company in a monthly address to the nation. Like Himachal and Uttarakhand, the first of the millets of the big anaj was made in Denmark. So today we have more than 5,000 farmers working with us, producing. We collect from these farmers, processes in a state-of-art processing unit in Rudrapur and then connected to the consumer through the distribution channel. So what we have worked on is basically as a bridge between this farmer and the consumer through the help of this information technology, the application part and the uh, connectivity part. So the farmer, the farthest of the villages are now connected through the telecom network and hence we can reach out to that farmer. Agarwal's story is just one among thousands in India's IT space. The total number of recognized startups has risen from 471 in 2016 to over 72,000 in June this year. According to investment fund Iron Pillar, by 2025, Indians are expected to set up over 250 unicorns a term that refers to privately held startups with a 1 billion US dollar valuation or above. At 75, India is producing more graduates than ever. From 2015 to 2020, student enrollment in higher education increased by almost 12%. After China, India produces the most graduates in STEM fields or science, technology, 
engineering and mathematics. If you go to Silicon Valley, I'm told there are many people from South Asia. As you know, both Microsoft and Google, and if I, if I remember right, IBM too, are headed by first generation Indians. So as long as you have electricity, you have a good, fast laptop, you can provide a service to people around the world. And Indians have shown that they can excel in something like that. India is also a young nation where the average age of the population is 29 years. The United Nations Population Fund says that the country will add 183 million workers between 2020 and 2050. This means that India alone will account for one-fifth of new workers globally in the next 30 years. Thirty-year-old Rohini Singh graduated with mathematics honors from the capital's premier women's college, Miranda House. She currently heads the media and content team at a business advisory multinational. Millennials like Rohini represent India's demographic dividend. Uh, look at China, Japan, South Korea, they have benefited greatly from their young population and I think us being in the generation that we are, we can benefit even more because uh, we have a large population and we're saying that half of that is uh, young. So that leads us to a lot of opportunities that could arise globally. And I think this generation is also, uh, it's not one to get stuck in one place, we're highly adaptable. So, you know, if you look at the pandemic, that's a, we adapted to work from home models. We've uh, uh, kind of managed to uh, move away from the traditional ways of thinking into a world where we can think like global citizens. And I think uh, the youth in India is doing that quite well. A global millennial survey in 2019 pointed out Indian youth are more positive in economic outlook and other issues compared to their global counterparts. I won't say that the legacy issues don't exist for us anymore because, uh, you know, our country's still young. We're still moving towards uh, a bright future. We, are, we may not be there yet, but that's where we're moving towards. And there are uh, uh, certain issues that our older generations have kind of left for us, whether that's uh, the environmental issues or, uh, you know, when it comes to um, the traditions and the culture that we're trying to keep while also moving ahead in the world. But I think the youth today is so adaptable, we're trying to move forward in, in a country where uh, there are issues that still persist, but there is a p positive outlook, there's a discourse, there's communication, you know, there's information which is shared uh, amongst everybody, social media, we're all talking to each other and figuring out ways uh, to help each other move forward. So while India at 75 is perhaps more hopeful than it has been in some time, some urge caution. I feel that being a young nation and having a huge uh, young population that is skilled, that is educated, that is, that is English speaking, is a big advantage to us. Uh, but we also have to understand that if this is not utilized in the proper way and in the right direction, then uh, this demographic dividend can also become a demographic liability. Communal polarization remains a challenge. Caste and ethnic conflicts hamper the march towards prosperity. While underemployment and poverty still affect hundreds of millions of people, the issues that marred the nation at its birth still haunt India 75 years on. India at 75 finds itself as the world's fastest growing large economy. But this prosperity is not shared by all. Here in Naglatulai village in Uttar Pradesh, 
about 270 kilometers from Delhi, there are no proper roads. The nearest school is four kilometers away. And because the village has no access to grid electricity, homework can be a challenge. Only one man in the village has ever gone to college and graduated. 34-year-old Amarnath Singh Shakya is now a teacher at a secondary school in another village. और रात में हम पढ़ नहीं सकते क्योंकि हमारे गांव में लाइट नहीं है तो हम मोबाइल चार्ज करके लाते उससे पढ़ते थे घर पे जब हम राजा करामपुर जाते थे तो मोबाइल चार्ज करने के लिए किसी घर पर दे देते थे तो दो दो तीन तीन घंटे तक इंतजार करना पर लाइट हो तो चार्ज हो जाता था नहीं बेटिंग करनी पड़ती थी जब लाइट आएगी तब हम मोबाइल चार्ज होगा एक डेढ़ घंटे में फिर उसके बाद लाकर तब रात में पढ़ाई करते थे अपनी पर राजा करामपुर जाकर वहाँ लाइट लट्ठे के नीचे अपना घोंबर पूरा करते थे बैठकर The village has about 50 families. Most of the men are daily wage workers earning around 1000 rupees or 12 US dollars and 50 cents a week only if they have work. Without a connection to the water mains, long queues form at a couple of hand pumps in the village. हमारे गांव की कंडीशन थोड़ी खराब है. जिससे लोगों का गुजारा बसारा नहीं चलता है कोरोना कोविड काल में जब काम बंद हो गया था तो सरकार ने पर मंथ दो बार राशन दिया मेडिसिन भी दी जिससे लोगों को मदद मिली गुजारा चला वो इस लायक नहीं है कि अगर काम बंद हो जाए तो खर्चा चल जाए किसी पास यहाँ जमीन नहीं है बेरोजगारी ज़्यादा है हम देखते हैं कि पचहत्तर साल हो गए हैं अभी तक हमारे गाँव को आज़ादी नहीं मिली है क्योंकि हमारे गांव में लाइट भी नहीं है फ्रिज कूलर कुछ भी नहीं है जिससे बच्चे पढ़ सकें या देख सकें कोई मोबाइल से पढ़ाई कर सकें वो आज भी परेशानियों से गुजर रहे हैं देर आर स्टिल थाउजेंड्स ऑफ अदर विलेजेस लाइक नगला थुलाई वेर बेसिक नेसेसिटीज a virtually non-existent. Inequality is still a pressing issue. Oxfam International estimates that India's top 10% owned about three quarters of the country's wealth. Meanwhile, about 60% of the population earn less than three US dollars and 20 cents a day. It's all relative. They are not as poor as their grandparents were, but they are far poorer than what they need, uh, what they needed to be. And that, I think, to a great extent, is failure on two fronts. Public health and basic education. To be able to read, write, and do some basic arithmetic. We have a strange situation. We have jobs, and a lot of people are unemployed, but we can't give them those jobs because we know that they won't be able to do them. There is another social divide that could derail India's trajectory. The progress made over the last decade has come against the backdrop of increasing sectarian tension. This coincides with the phenomenal rise of the current ruling Bharatiya Janata Party, or BJP. The opposition has accused Prime Minister Modi and his party of polarizing the country, playing up Hindu nationalism, or Hindutva, for political gain. Political polarization on the basis of religious identity has been a specific political tactic of the ruling party and their allies. In other words, the Hindutva movement, which sees India not as a land of diversity, where our nationalism is anchored in civic institutions and a civic democratic constitution, but rather as a civilization which they consider to be purely Hindu, that has somehow been, um, shall we say, diluted by the impact of Islam, Christianity, and other influences. They want to return India, as they see it, um, to something which some would argue it never was, namely a pure Hindu state. 
The BJP denies these allegations, pointing out that many communal riots occurred during the preceding 60 plus years of Congress rule. Some people in the opposition are trying to create that narrative. Let me point out that uh, these are parties that have run India for most of the 75 years that we've been uh, independent. And if you look at the track record of riots and um, clashes that they had under them, right here in Delhi in 1984, when uh, there was a pogrom, when 3,000 Sikhs were killed, I dare any uh, neutral observer to go to any part of India and check that does the Modi government indulge in discrimination? There is not a single example of any discrimination, neither based on religion nor based on any other factor. But even in Prime Minister Modi's constituency of Varanasi, there is an undercurrent of uneasiness. Varanasi is an ancient Hindu holy city on the river Ganga. Considered one of the oldest living settlements in the world, rituals and life have flourished here for more than 3,000 years. Varanasi's long tradition of classical music and the arts has inspired some of the finest craftsmen, artists and musicians through the ages. One such family of craftsmen is Atik Ansaris. For more than a century and a half, the family has made exquisite Banarasi saris. Sixty-six-year-old Ansari explains how his family kept the tradition alive through generations. My grandfather was about 12 years old from his childhood, and with his widow mother, he migrated from the Badoi side to Banarasi. और यहाँ आके उनकी माँ ने मतलब मेरे ग्रैंडफादर की माँ ने उनको हैंडलूम में बुनाई सीखने के लिए बिठाया जब वो थोड़ा सा ग्रोनअप हुए पंद्रह सोलह साल के और ठीक ठाक बुनाई करने लगे बनारसी साड़ी का जो आर्ट है ये बहुत ही एक्सक्लूसिव तो है ये सदियों पुराना है बहुत पुराना है सारीज आर सिम्बल्स ऑफ इंडियन आइडेंटिटी वोन बाय वेमेन ऑफ ऑल फेट्स Though considered a holy city among Hindus, Varanasi has a sizable Muslim population. They make up about 15% of its 4 million plus inhabitants, or around 630,000 people. Ansari has seen communal conflicts break out around the country. Communal right or communal feeling, communalism, two different things. ठीक है तो कम्युनल राइट तो यहाँ पर अनफॉर्चुनेटली हुए मंदिर मूवमेंट की जब शुरुआत हुई थी 86 राउंड अबाउट और उसके बाद 89 तक आके वो पीक पर पहुँचा और 92 में आके मस्जिद का डिमोलिशन हुआ ये अयोध्या का तो उस दौरान यहाँ पे तीन चार दंगे हुए 89 में हुआ 90 में हुआ 91 में हुआ फिर 92 में हुआ ये बड़े दंगे हुए विदिन अ मंथ कर्फ्यू हटने के महीने भर बाद सब कुछ एकदम नॉर्मल रिश्ते बिल्कुल पहले जैसे ये यहाँ का सीन रहा है आपस में कम्युनल फीलिंग या कम्युनल हेटरेज ये बनारस के अंदर इन कंपैरिजन ऑफ अदर सिटीज़ और अदर स्टेट्स बहुत कम मिलेगा ये यहाँ की विशेषता है बल्कि मैं ये कहता हूँ दावे के साथ कि ये शहर सिर्फ रेशमी साड़ियों का शहर नहीं यहाँ का मिजाज भी रेशमी है और ये सच्चाई है But the mood may soon change over a disputed religious site. 38-year-old Vivek Singh Rathor is a devout Hindu who begins each day with prayer offerings on the banks of the Ganga. Rathor is the state unit chief of the hardline Hindu group Kani Sena. The group supports the lawsuit filed by Hindu priests seeking permission to worship their deity 
in the Gyanwapi Mosque complex in Varanasi. Original Kashi Vishnath ki jo swelling hai, usi masjid ke niche hai. Aap dekhiyega, kabhi aapko mauka mile, aap Baba Vishnath jaiye, jo main nandi hai, nandi ka mu Gyanwapi Masjid ki taraf hai. मुगल आक्रांताओं द्वारा मंदिर को तोड़ करके वहाँ मस्जिद का निर्माण किया गया है बलपूर्वक निर्माण किया गया है अगर हम अपना धर्म और हम अपनी मंदिर अगर कोर्ट के माध्यम से ले रहे हैं तो उसमें क्या बुराई है सिमिलर केसेस लाइक दिस सच इज वेन बाबरी मस्जिद और बाबरी मॉस्क वॉज डिमोलिश्ड इन नाइनटीन टू बिल्ड द राम टेम्पल इन अयोध्या sparked widespread communal violence. In that conflict, over 2,000 people were killed. It's become rather sad to see history being misused, not as a source of enlightenment or knowledge or deepening understanding, but rather as a battle axe to attack other communities with. The truth is that history is history, it belongs in the past. To resurrect it in order to settle scores in the present is deeply, deeply unproductive and in fact dangerous for the future of our society. The government of India is clearly on the side of the constitution and certainly the governing party of India, the BJP. Now I encourage anybody who doubts this to go and read the BJP's own constitution. Our constitution requires us to treat every Indian as equal. So to suit the narrative some people try to spin it negatively. I think the question needs to be put in context. There are fringe elements across the political spectrum. There are left-wing groups who are actively involved openly in trying to overthrow the constitution, overthrow the uh, republic. And this narrative that claims that India is polarized totally ignores this aspect. And that's not fair. The law very clearly says that no new disputes must be opened. Whatever disputes existed at the time of independence, they need to be resolved. This is one of the cases which has, has been in courts earlier. It's not a new case. For Ansari, he remains hopeful that conflict will not be visited upon his beloved city. The final result is that here the Hindu and Muslim can't live together without each other. So the two communities will come together with each other. That's my belief. It will be time to go. Getting its own house in order will be important for India at 75, as the nation eyes a bigger role on the international stage. No nation today wants India on the wrong side. You know, they they want to befriend India. They want India on their side, and India is that country which can tilt the favors. India celebrated its 75th anniversary of independence on August the 15th, emerging from the COVID pandemic. The pandemic devastated the world's second most populous nation in the middle of 2021, with the daily death toll exceeding 4,000. But by year's end, India had turned things around. India is actually a beacon for the rest of the world. If you look at how we tackled the COVID pandemic, uh, two and a half years ago it was considered that India would not be up to the challenge and would, would basically be brought to its knees. We've done remarkably well compared to the dire predictions that had been made. We've uh, run the world's largest and fastest vaccination campaign. We have helped well over 150 other countries, not just with vaccines, but with many other uh, means. At its 65th anniversary, India was the 10th largest economy, and in the decades since, it has grown by 40%. Among big countries, only China grew at a faster pace of 53% over the same period. Some, like Maharaja Krishna Rasgotra, who saw India at its birth, revel in the nation's progress. 
There were no roads. There were 20,000 20, miles of railways in this huge country. Today you have uh, 360,000 miles of railways. Roadways. Uh, enormous progress in this country. This economic progress has given the nation a newfound global stature and confidence. A point noted by Prime Minister Modi in his Independence Day speech. At 75, India finds itself in a world divided. US-China tensions run high, while the Russia-Ukraine war threatens a resurgence of Cold War-era politics. India could tip the scales of balance, especially against its sometimes rival, China. Countries like USA want, wants to partner with India. Even China doesn't want India on the wrong side, you know, though it might have a lot of grudges, a lot of problems, but no nation today wants India on the wrong side. You know, they, they want to befriend India, they want India on their side. And India is that country which can tilt the favors. India has been wooed in the past also. And uh, uh, we have sometimes done the right thing and sometimes not done the right thing in the past. Currently, yes, the China factor is important because the rest of the world is concerned about the way China has been behaving. China has become the world's second largest economy and military power precisely by taking advantage of the global systems that exist. Um, and now it has not been playing by those rules. So that's a factor. But I think the bigger reason that the world is looking up to India today is because of India. Uh, because under Prime Minister Modi, India has emerged in a very attractive way. And the whole world used to keep asking why isn't India stepping up to the plate. Now that's happening. I have a belief that the strongest foreign policy any nation can have is to have sustained high rates of economic growth. That gives you the ability to do lots of things. We are being wooed to become a partner or an ally of another big power. And we are dancing a very awkward dance with the former superpower, which is still a significant force in the world, Russia. So it's not quite the same as what happened in the 1950s. We have to be much more adroit in the game we play. Russian President Vladimir Putin reminded Modi of this relationship in a message sent on India's 75th anniversary. In it, he also praised India for its global importance. We are like the lady whom everybody wants to take out for a date, whether it's the West, whether it is Russia, whether it is China. But that's a transitory phase, uh, to a great extent driven by the war in Ukraine. See, international affairs and international positions and international clout is a superstructure. It's like building a multi-story building. You need to have the foundation strong. Your ability to project yourself depends upon your economic strength, your military strength, and your soft power. To ensure its place among the superpowers, India will need to continue its growth. And some, like Ayushi, hopes it will be a more inclusive one. Large country like India, inclusive growth is a very ambitious project. It's not going to happen overnight. And especially coming, you know, in 1947 when, when we were grappling with famines and floods and those kind of issues, reaching the stage itself is an achievement of sorts. We still have a lot of kids who are malnutritioned. We still have infant mortality. We still are grappling with uh, education, which is slightly substandard. But I think we have the ability to fix it. It's just a matter of time, and the national will ensure that this happens, you know, sooner than later. And as India recalls the promises its founding fathers made 75 years ago, 
of a country free of poverty, inequality, and strife. It's making new promises for the future. A tryst with its destiny. Sabhalta, vipalta, aasha, nirasha, na jane kitne padaav aaye hai. Lekin, in padaav ke bich bhi, Bharat, आगे बढ़ता है हमें इस पच्चीस साल में विकसित भारत बना के रहना है अपनी आंखों के सामने I've always been hopeful of it, about India simply because we've been through very many dark moments and we've always seemed to have come out all right. There's something about the resilience of our society and civilization and about the indomitable spirit of our people that constantly gives me hope. I think we are on the trajectory uh, for uh, becoming the third largest economy in the world uh, and a clear middle income country uh, putting behind our history of several centuries of poverty. India is the success story that the world is looking to for the next generation and the foreseeable future. I, I have a great, not hope, great belief uh, in this country in the next 25 years. It will be one of the three top powers. And I think it will be number two, not number three. Number three will be China. I do see a much brighter future for India. India at 100 would be an economic powerhouse.